evening, everyone. We can actually... Oh, no. Okay, I was just going to say we can actually see you tonight. But we believe that you are still there. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we, again, we're welcoming you by the table. Did you came to see us or sit by the table? Both. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very gracious. Um, we're going to go and rehearse again room at the table and today let's see if we can hear more of your beautiful voices okay let's do it Well, good evening and welcome to night number three of uh, Room at His Table. It's wonderful to be together, isn't it, at Big Camp? Uh, all of you who are with us uh, here in the Big Tent tonight, don't you agree? Yes. And I'm sure you'll agree, for those of you at home, that uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to tune in from afar, but not quite as good as being right here on the spot. Let's, let's hear, let's let the audience, let everyone at home know how good it is to be here at South Australian Big Camp 2024. How good is this? It is wonderful. 
to be here and to be enjoying a wonderful feast together. So far, uh, as we've journeyed along together with uh, Dr. Joe Kidder, we have journeyed to the heart of God. Haven't you grown closer to the heart of God uh, together? And I know I certainly have. As we've gone through the intimacy of prayer, as we've been in awe and wonder of worship of our great God and King, and tonight as we consider the amazing joy and delight of living His salvation. Well, as I think about journey, uh, you know, journey is such a powerful memory event. And when I was, uh, uh, in fact, I'd say the earliest, most vivid memory of my life was when I was three years old. Who remembers when they were three years old? Some of you do. And, you know, my earliest memory was going on a journey from Victoria to some, what some of you would call the promised land, South Australia. <laughs> and that same year, going to Queensland. And it's become a memory that I will never, ever forget, a wonderful journey. And part of that journey was the fact that uh, in the years that followed, if you've ever remembered being a child in the back seat of a car, that was where you sat, wasn't it? You're in the kiddie seat, and you dreamt of one day being in the front seat uh, together with mom or dad or grandma and grandpa. Isn't that right? And uh, in my case, I got there a little earlier than many of my peers because my grandparents had uh, three seats at the front of their vehicle. And the wonder and the joy of being able to sit in those front seats and to be together with them and see what they would see and to be knowing where we were going, but really just to be there present together with them on the journey. There was room together with my grandparents for that journey. And there was room together in groups of twos and threes, in small groups, as we journey together, as we grow together uh, in the love and the joy of knowing God. But also, I have wonderful memories, as many of you will as well, of coming together uh, for family events. Big events like this, celebrations, anniversaries, uh, and other special occasions. And there would be a kiddie table... And there would be the adult table. And you would dream of getting to the adult table one day when you'd grown up enough to do so. Well, I'm here tonight to tell you that there is no such thing as a kiddie table in God's kingdom. There is one table and there is room at his table. It doesn't matter whether you are Gentile or Jew, whether you are male or female, or or whether for that matter you are slave or free. It doesn't matter who we are or where we've come from or what we've done. God says, you know what, there is room at my table, room at his table for you and for me. And uh, we want to welcome you tonight because there is room at God's table for you. Welcome uh, to room at his table in 2024. By the way, one thing I neglected to mention is for those of you who are here, we have a very special prayer wall at the back end of the tent uh, here in the, our great big new marquee for our, from our children and they've been praying for us and for those of you at home and uh, we ask that you pray for them as well so if you're here in the tent once you stop past and join in the intimacy of prayer with God's children at the prayer wall uh, tonight but welcome there is room at his table for you good evening everyone I'm here to welcome up to the stage two ladies who have been blessing us this week, Marsha William and Julie Baum. So if you could come forward, please. We just want to have a very quick thank you for both of you joining us this week at South Australia. How many of you have enjoyed their messages that they've had for us this week? (laughs) Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. Come join me here. We've been blessed with both of them speaking about well-being. How important is that? We've had Marsha speaking about mental health and well-being through the story of the woman at the well, I think. I listened to a little bit of it. It was fantastic. Thank you, Marsha. And thank you for blessing us with music last night and I think tonight as well. So we're in for a special treat there. And Julie, thank you for blessing us with health through the Three Angels message and today through lifestyle changes. So, ladies, I just want to say a big thank you for making time to come and speak with us. And I know everyone has appreciated it. We've got a small token of appreciation. So, thank you, Julie. Thank you. Marsha. It's 
all right. We hope that you enjoy this small, delicious gift that we have for you. And we wish you God's blessings in your ministry, ladies. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us this week. Thank you. Well, it's time now to lift up our voices and give praise to God with our first hymn tonight. Please stand as we sing all creatures of our God and King. sing Marching to Zion. The children will be coming up while we're singing. Thank you. Jesus loves me. Yeah. 
and girls how is everybody today that's good oh we've got lots of kids tonight we have got can everybody fit on the mat oh, we've got some people sitting a wee bit to the side well I've got an exciting thing to talk to you about tonight and I wanted to show you something I don't know if you can see this or not I'm going to hold it so you can have a little look can anybody see what's in my container here Oh, what is it? It's honey. Is it honey? And it's a special sort of honey. Did you see it had sort of white, waxy stuff on top of it? Yeah. That's where the bees have put the honey into a special comb. They call it a comb. It's a lot like the comb that you comb your hair with. Not that sort of comb. But it's a special one where they put the honey in and then they seal it over and they store it away. Well, I wonder how you get that honey. Hmm, does anybody know how we get that honey? Where does it come from? How do bees. I it comes from bees, yeah, but where do the bees have it? Where do they put it? Flowers. From the flowers, but then where does it go? In the stomach. In their stomach? Oh. On their legs. What do you say? into their home yeah so sometimes bees have their homes up in trees and sometimes people keep bees in a beehive and that's what I've got at my place I've got a beehive and I've got some bees and when I go to look at my bees or maybe check to see if there's excess honey I have to put on a bee suit hmm oh well this is my brother Darren yeah, and he's going to put a bee suit on. And this is the bee suit that I use to go and check my bees. So while he's going to put that on there, we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you go and check your bees. Now, look at this funny thing I've got over here. Look at this. What is that? Oh, does anybody know what it's called? Ah, that's right, it's a smoker, yeah. You make a little fire in here, get it going and you start smoking and the fire goes out, but there's smoke that's in there. And when I use it to go and check my bees, I put some puffs around the hive and the bees think, oh, I wonder what's going on here. We might have to leave our home soon. So they start eating the honey. And that means that they're not worried about me so much looking in their hive they are like, oh, we better get some honey in our tummies in case we have to leave in a hurry. So here, here's Uncle Darren. He's getting my... <laughs> he thought that it was going to be a bee suit, as in a bee costume that he had to wear. <laughs> and he was like, nah. But no, he's, he's, got, a, he's got my bee my beekeeping suit on. Now, can you see, boys and girls, that he is covered right up He's got a special hat around on him and he's also got some gloves there. And if he was going to check bees, he'd have um, some good boots on as well. Why does he have to wear that? Why do you think? Why do you think? So the bees don't sting him. Yeah, that's right. Well, I want to tell you that I was dressed up like Darren. I looked a little bit more like a white Teletubby than Darren does. <laughs> But I went down to check on my bees one time and I was opening them up and I was pulling out the frames. And as I was working, I suddenly felt something. Over here, I could feel something crawling on the inside of my suit. And I went, uh-oh, that's not supposed to happen. 
And so I carefully put down my hive tool and different things and I walked away and I could feel little tiny legs crawling around my neck. Uh-oh. And so I thought, I have to get up to the house because sometimes bees like to land on your suit so you can't just walk away from the hive and take it off, like the top off, because other bees could be still around. So I had to walk up to the house and I'm holding it here because I didn't want the bees to go down here, the bee. So I'm holding it here underneath and then the bee started going up here. I'm like, oh, close my eye. The bee went around like, oh, please, Lord, please help the bee not sting me. Oh, have everybody had a bee sting here? Sore, isn't it? I didn't want to get a bee sting, yeah. So when I got up to the house, I knocked on the door. Oh, they're not nice, are they? And one of my boys came out and they checked me for bees and I took off my hood. And do you know what? That bee flew away and I didn't get stung. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, Uncle Darren. You can take that one off. Well, I want to tell you... That in the Bible, did you know that there's another type of suit? Hmm. It's not a bee suit, though. It's a special type of suit. And it's actually called an armour. I want to show you in my book here. Has anybody seen this book before? Oh, the Bible stories. That's a really good book. If you don't have it at your house, you need to go and see either the literature of Angelus or Ask mum and dad to go and visit the resource centre because these books are really good. These are like the Bible, the big Bible that people have, but it's in kids' form. Now, can you see that man there? He's wearing armour, isn't he? And that's called the armour of God. Now, it's a special type of suit, this one. This isn't one like the one that Uncle Darren put on that you zip up. And mind you, I've learnt to zip up all those zips very carefully so I don't leave any holes for bees to crawl in. With this one here, this is actually an invisible suit. Wow, that's pretty good, isn't it? It's a bit like, you know how you don't normally see angels or God? That's what this suit's like. It protects you. It's a special suit, but you can't see it. Do you know how we can find out about this suit and how we can put it on? Well, we find out by reading our Bibles. Who's got a Bible or a little children's Bible story book like this at home? Yeah, that's really good. And you know the best place to keep it is right beside your bed. And when you wake up in the morning, you can say, Hello, Jesus. Thank you for giving me a good night's sleep. And when you look at these little storybooks, you can find out about how Jesus can look after you because he loves you very much. Do you know Jesus loves you? Yeah. And you can pray to Jesus. Who likes to pray to Jesus? Yeah, me too. And you can read in here and you can sing to Jesus as well. And do you know what? He loves to protect us. He wants to stop st Satan from stinging us and hurting us. He wants to be with us when we're little tiny people until we get big people, until we get older as well. Because you know what? Satan doesn't want us to be with Jesus and go to heaven later. He, don't want, he wants to keep us out of there. So we need to read our Bibles, our children's Bibles, and we need to pray and sing to Jesus so we have that special protection that God gives us, that he'll always be with us no matter what happens. So for you guys, you're going to go back. I've got something that Darren and I are going to give you to go back with. Now, I'll get the one out. So we'll do this, and then you guys can go back to your seats if you like. Okay, if you want to get one of those from Uncle Darren and then one of these from me. Thank you.
as all the children are going back to their seats, thank you for the story, Suzanne, about the bees and our armours. And we're going to sing now, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So we'll keep singing and put our armour on and, and turn our eyes upon Jesus. You all like to stand up, please? blessing a real privilege when we talk to God in prayer God listens to us carefully as if we were the only ones talking to him in the whole wild world so tonight I have the privilege of leading us in prayer may I ask you to bow your heads let's talk to God gracious Heavenly Father blessed be thy name Lord we do not wish to continue this program without making sure that you are present in this place. Please, Lord, come down to us in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Anoint the lips of Pastor Joe as he shares with us the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector as they went to pray to the temple. Speak to our hearts and minds and translate the words of Pastor Joe according to the needs of every heart. Lord, this is our prayer. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you very much uh, for your prayers on my behalf. Um, I felt a little bit sick yesterday. We were over here for over half an hour praying, and it was cold, and I felt it. So I, I stayed in uh, my room most of the day, and I feel much better right now. Uh, so thank you very much for your prayers. I, I just wanted to uh, mention some of the books uh, that I have written at the Resource Center and tell you a little bit about them. And whatever the press gives me is going to build a church in Iraq, in Nineveh. This one is living with the mind of Jesus. As you know, there is a lot of things going on in the world, many, many different worldviews. So this is trying to understand the culture in the light of the Bible, and also how to raise your kids or grandkids with a biblical understanding and biblical worldview. This is living with the mind of Jesus. This is uh, out of Babylon. That's the st part of the story I'm going to share with you on Sabbath is taken from this one here. Uh, this is uh, how I became a Christian. But there are a lot of other interesting stories. I will share with you one of them later on, maybe tomorrow night. Uh, Journey to the Heart of God. Uh, this one is on spiritual growth. Uh, this is extremely popular because a lot of churches are using it for a prayer meeting, uh, for Sabbath school, for a smaller group, or for... Uh, uh, you know, uh, spiritual growth. He's my friend. Uh, he likes to come to the front. Uh, moving Your Church uh, is a research we did on growing Seventh-day Adventist churches and the lessons we learned from them. It's really about discipleship. And it is not written from a research perspective. It's more a narrative, a lot of stories. If you are especially a leader in your church, this is something that you have to have. And majesty, uh, this the last one, is really about uh, worship and all of the element that goes into worship. Uh, the sermon from yesterday is one of the chapters from this book, The Clicker. So today uh, I would like to share with you uh, one of the parables of Jesus. Uh, before I get into the story, I want to give you some principle. And that is, a lot of times we think that when Jesus is telling a parable, it's kind of like a story that will capture the attention of the kids. It's much deeper than that. The parables of Jesus have basically four important elements to them. Number one, he always challenges the hearer, always challenges their way of thinking. Number two, he always teaches them about the kingdom of God and about theology. Number three, there is always ethical requirement of how to live a citizen of the kingdom of God. And number four is a picture of God. And especially this last one, you will see it in this parable. Actually, you will see almost all of them in this parable. I notice, especially in the United States, maybe the same thing here. There is a lot of fascination with people who claim who have died and went to heaven and came back and write books about it. And a lot of these books are becoming bestsellers. The only thing is not even two of these books are similar to each other. 
So apparently the, each one is going to a different heaven. But Jesus in this parable tells us exactly how you get to heaven. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will speak through me. Lord, I, I want to bring this parable to life. I want to make it meaningful, relevant, and something that will thrill us, that will bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Pharisee, the tax collector, and Jesus. Five verses. Here it is. And he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. He said, two men went up into the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Isn't that wonderful? Other people are swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get. But the tax collector standing some distance away was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we're going to look at them in this order. The Pharisee, and then after that, we are going to look at the tax collector. I have to be honest with you and tell you, the most exciting part is when we get to the second part. You will see a lot of things you never have seen before. But we still have to do the first part because that's a full story. So look with me at what the guy said. His prayer had two sections, a positive one and a negative one. So he said, the, the first one is, this is the Pharisee, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. And he lists a bunch of people. He's not like them. He never swindles. He is not unjust. He's not adulterers or even like this tax collector. And then he moves into the first part was looking at other people in a negative way and looking at himself in a positive way. And then he tells you a lot of positive things about himself. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all that I get. Now you will say, what's the meaning of this? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what the meaning of that is. There was only one day required for fasting in the Old Testament, just one day. And that is during the Day of Atonement. The Pharisee is saying that he is fasting 100 days a year. I mean, whatever God said, he multiplied by a hundredfold. So you have to give him some credit for that. Every week he is fasting twice. And usually these fasts were on Monday and Wednesday. They chose these two days because those were the market days. So they could go to the market and people will see that they were fasting and that's why Jesus said, if you are fasting, don't show it. Okay, what about the tithe? Well, he's not only talking about regular tithe. He's talking about like your produce from your garden. 
I mean, how many of you have thought about uh, tithing the produce of your garden? Well, he did. If his house went up in value, he paid the tithe on it. This man is really a good man. In the culture of that time, the Pharisee was the best of Judaism. He was the one you want your daughter to marry or your sister to marry him. Very outstanding man, righteous man. He is the one who teaches the law. He is the one who knows God very well. But uh, Jesus uh, uh, said, all of these things are of no value to God. All of it is of no value to God. Notice what the issue here. Self-reliance versus God's reliance for salvation. All what he wanted to do was, it's me. I am the one who makes myself. I am the one who is going to make it to heaven. And self-centeredness and self-righteousness, that's all what he came across. Um, We usually, when we think of other people, look at their vices and think of our virtue. Remember what he did? I'm not like that guy over there, especially the tax collector. He never asked for forgiveness. He doesn't need it. He doesn't think he has sin. He does all of the right things. He never asked to be justified. He never asked God's grace to cover all of his sins because he cannot see his sins. All what he sees is his accomplishment. He will be a quintessential seven-day Adventist. I mean, imagine if we have people like this who keep the Sabbath perfectly, who pay tithe perfectly, We would never have any problem financially if we have people like this man. And God said, it's worthless, all of this. This is from John MacArthur. The dominant religion, the, the, the dominant religious idea in Judaism at the time of our Lord, the dominant religious idea in the world always Then and now is the idea that good people go to heaven. That if you are moral and religious, you can achieve salvation, escape from divine judgment, become acceptable to God. It's a matter of how good you are, how moral you are, and how spiritual or religious you are. This is frankly the big idea that dominates the world, that people can earn heaven by being good enough. It is to such people that this story is directed. As far as the way of salvation is uh, is concerned, there are only two religions the world has ever known or will ever know. The religion of divine accomplishment, which is biblical Christianity, and the religion of human achievement, which includes all other kind of religion by whatever names they may go under. I love the way he is uh, classifying them. Only two religions in the world. The, The religion of divine accomplishment or a human achievement. That's it. And there's only one that goes by divine accomplishment, and that's Christianity. Christianity celebrates the accomplishment of Christ saving us and reconciling us to God. You know, there is another thing that this man is not aware of, and that is that Jesus redefined sin for us. 
uh, well, I'll just give you three examples. Jesus redefined adultery for us. From the act itself to the contemplation of the thoughts when he said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman or a man lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Look at how he defines murder. He also redefined murder to move from the physical act of killing someone to being angry. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and everyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Amazing. Uh, then he moves from the act of love from just loving the people who love us to the people who hate us and are our enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Do you see, uh, this Pharisee was not aware of the fact that he is so far short of the glory of God. Paul in Romans chapter 3, he says, we are continually, all the time, falling short of the glory of God. In thy sight, no man living is righteous. All of our righteousness is like filthy rag. Unless your righteousness surpass that of the scribe and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Ellen White tells us this amazing thing. The religious services, the prayers, the praise, the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary, but passing through the corrupt channel of humanity, they are so defiled that unless purified by the blood, they can never be of value with God. She's saying even our prayers, our praise is not good enough unless it goes through the blood of Jesus Christ. The summary of the Pharisee. Here's what it is. He has a good eye on himself. A bad eye on his neighbor and no eye on God, and no understanding of God, really, have zero understanding of what sin is and what salvation is. He was mechanically doing the things that he was instructed to do. Okay, the tax collector. Before I get into this, I have to tell you, there is something significant in this story. Jesus does not say, that that those two men went into the synagogue. Very specifically, he said, they went into the temple. Why? Because in the synagogue, they did what we do in church. Like, you you find the same thing in Luke chapter 4, Jesus went into the synagogue. The synagogue was invented because of the Babylonian captivity to teach the people the ways of God. But the temple was different. Two things happened at the temple. God's presence was manifested, and the sacrificial lamb was offered. These two things were offered at the temple. They had two services at the temple, one at 9 o'clock in the morning and one at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Most likely, those two men went into the three o'clock. Now, it's very possible the Pharisee went also to the nine o'clock one because most people went to the temple at three o'clock. Most people were farmers, so they have to work the farm in the morning, and then they went into the temple in the afternoon. Here it is. Two things. God's presence was manifested. The sacrificial lamb was offered. 
As for the tax collectors, extortion was built into the job. This guy is exactly opposite of the other one. One of them was the highly esteemed person of society. This one was the despised person in society. Uh, the Romans had it like kind of a franchise, and the highest bidder will get the job of being a tax collector, but he will tack on his own profit. That's how they made their living. So in a way, he was despised in three ways. Number one, because he was a tax collector. I don't think anybody likes to pay taxes. Number two is because he tacked on his own profit. And number three, he collaborated with the Romans, the enemies. So this guy was really hated. As for the tax collector, extortion was built into the job. Injustice was part of the trade. Tychus, the Roman historian, says that once he visited a village that had such an honest tax collector that the village erected a monument to his memory. It, it just doesn't happen. Some men, and this guy continues, are traitors by one craven deed of cowardice. But a tax collector was a traitor all day and every day. He was despised by most people, and instead he spent much of his time with extortionists, evildoers, and the sexually loose. You can't find a worse person than this guy. Okay. So I'm going to give you the prayer, possibly the prayer, of the tax collector. This tax collector could have stood in the presence of God and said, Oh God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. I especially thank you I am not like that Pharisee. I don't pray long prayers in public. I don't pray like a religious type. I know I have sinned. And I'm willing to admit it. And even if I had done all these things, at least you know and I know that I am not a hypocrite. What do you think? Will that be something you would have said? But he didn't say that. His prayer was maybe one of the shortest in the Bible. The tax collector standing some distance away, he knew he was unworthy was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. He felt shame. He was beating his breast. He was overwhelmed with guilt, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He sensed his sinful nature. God's presence was manifested, and the tax collector felt it. And every time you feel God's presence, you feel your sinfulness. My ears, as Job talking, had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Woe to me, Isaiah. I cried, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And uh, Peter, when he was in the presence of Jesus, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinner. And Paul, here is a trustworthy saying, that deserve full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. The most amazing thing about this, Paul does not say, I was the worst. He said, now I am the worst, now. If you live in the presence of God, 
and live in the light of his holiness, you will see your sin. And when you see your sin, you'll see your need of forgiveness. And you cry out to God for grace to cleanse you. And in a white says, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfection will be seen in a broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Steps to Christ 64. And Haddon Robinson said, one of the benefits of living in God's presence is this. When you really see God, you see yourself. When you see yourself, you see your sin. When you see your sin, you cry out to God for grace and forgiveness, and you receive it. The saint is always more aware of his need of God than his successes in God. Always more aware of how far he has to go than how far he has come. That is exactly what happened to this tax collector. He f- experienced God's presence and he felt the sinfulness of his nature. The sacrificial lamb was offered. The tax collector felt his own sinfulness, and now he sees the lamb. And you know how they did this. They took this lamb, they inspected it, they made sure that it has no spots or no blemishes, and they tied like this one here, and then they slaughtered it. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Here's what he was doing. Why? Did you know that this expression is mentioned only twice in the whole Bible of beating the breast or beating the chest twice in the entire Bible? And both of them are in the Gospel of Luke. Let me read for you the other place. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtains of the temple were torn into two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he has said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all of the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, what did they do? What did they do? They started to beat their breast and then went away. Let me give you a little bit of background. My uncle was a treasurer of a company in Nineveh, in Mosul. And one day, some thugs went into this uh, company, and he struggled with them, and he tried to reason with them. Finally, they shot him and killed him. I was 10 years, 12 years old, something like that. So they had a funeral for him, and I went to the funeral. And I noticed all of the women, my mom, my grandmother, my two aunts, all of them were going like this. But I did not see any man doing this. Not one man, only the women were doing this. This is a sign of deep sorrow 
a sign of deep anguish, a sign of deep pain, but only reserved for women. It's kind of like it's unmanly for a man to do that. At the cross, everybody was doing it. It says when all of the people, not only the women, all of the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breast and went away. Kenneth Bailey spent 20 years trying to understand this. He said, after 20 years of observation, I have found only one occasion, just one, in which Middle Eastern men are accustomed to beat on their chest. This is the Ashura ritual of Shiite Islam. This ritual is a reenactment of the murder of Hussein, the son of Ali, the son-in-law of Muhammad. When they reenact the murder scene, they do so in a dramatic way. The men lacerate their shaved heads with knives and razors in a demonstration of intense anguish. At this ritual, the men beat on their chest. Women customarily beat on their chest at funerals, but men do not. For men, it is a gesture of extreme sorrow or ang and anguish, almost never used. It's little wonder that in all biblical literature, we find this gesture mentioned only in the account of this parable and at the cross. And I love the ending. It takes something of the magnitude of Golgotha to evoke this gesture from Middle Eastern men. That's the experience of that tax collector. He saw the lamb and it just evokes such emotion inside of him. He started beating on his breast. He was in deep anguish and sorrow and pain over his sins. The righteous, this is an old Jewish commentary, beat their hearts because the heart is the source of all evil, evil longing. And Jesus paraphrased this, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. Um, the tax collector, the, the, the sacrificial lamb was offered and the tax collector was watching it. So I'd like you to open your Bibles with me to the parable because I would like to show you something interesting. Go with me to Luke 18. Look at um, verse. Look at verse 13 and 14. And the tax collector, starting afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. This, this statement, be merciful, is not being nice to me. He's not saying that. Okay, Luke is a masterful writer. There is a story that just comes, just a few verses later. So go with me now to verse 38. This is 
the blind, uh, the blind man Bartimaeus. And the blind man, in verse 38, he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, this one is mercy. This one is be compassionate toward me. But what the tax collector was not saying that. You know what the word he was using? Be propitiation for me. Be an atonement for me. Be the reconciliation for me. It's the same word that Paul uses in Hebrews 2.17. Be propitiation for the sins of the people. Therefore, he had to be made like his brother in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest and thinks pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That's in the New American Standard Bible. In the NIV, it says it's an atonement. And in the King James, it's reconciliation. That's what he was saying. He was saying, be the atonement for me. Because this little lamb is not going to do it. I need more than that. I need you. And Paul said, for there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. Just a couple more things about this story. What is in chapter 19 of Luke? Look at chapter 19 of Luke. That Zacchaeus, that is like a 500 fortune tax collector. And Jesus tells us through the story of Zacchaeus, he accepted all of the prayers of the tax collector who went into the temple. He said to Zacchaeus, you come down and go with me. I, I want to go to your house today. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, two weeks later, Jesus died to accomplish our salvation. I wanted to find the way to summarize all of this. When I started to fly a lot a few years ago, I flew one day from South Bend, that's the closest city to me, about 30, 35 miles. Flew to Chicago O'Hare, and at that time, that was the busiest airport in the world. The flight was six o'clock in the morning, so that meant I have to wake up 3.30 to get to the airport, to park the car, to get on the plane. We got to Chicago. I was hungry. It's packed with people everywhere you go, people. And I needed to go to the bathroom, but I have dirt phobia. I looked at the bathroom. I said, there's no way I'm going to go to the bathroom here. I felt hungry. I couldn't find anything I like. And then as I was walking, I looked to my right, and I, I see the sign that says, United a Club. So I looked inside, and it's a wonderful place. It's like the most beautiful place, oasis in the desert. I, I look to my right, and the food, amazing. Uh, muffins, and yogurts, and eggs, and bread, and cheese, everything you could think about, all kind of juices. I look to the left, and I see the bathroom, and they have carnation in it, and roses. <laughs> Not even my bathroom at home has that stuff, but they had it over there. 
So I said, this is the place where I need to be. So I went in, in there, and this lady stopped me. She said, where is your membership? I said, well, I fly United. Here's my ticket. Oh, she said, oh, no, no. This is for our elite flyers who fly a lot and pay hundreds of dollars to have access to this club. Well, I said, I fly a lot. She said, let me look at uh, your ticket. She looked at my ticket. She said, Mr. Kidder, you don't even qualify to use our bathroom. (laughs) You need to leave. I said, but I can't go out there. She said, fine. You have to pay $900 to be here. I said, I don't have $900. Well, she said, you have to leave. And I left. She broke my heart. I was devastating. I, I couldn't believe it. She just kicked me out of that place. So two weeks later, it just happened. I was sitting next to Neil Eric Andreessen, who was the president of Andrews University at that time. And he started asking me questions and all of that stuff. And when we arrived in Chicago, he said to me, "Uh, did you eat a breakfast? I said, no. Why? He said, why don't you come with me? Uh, I'll take you to the the club. I, I said, no, I can't do that. I already was rejected at the club two weeks ago. He said, just come with me. Don't worry about it. So we went to the club. And I look inside, it's the same woman. <laughs> so, so what I did was, I started to hide myself behind him. The minute he left to the right or to the left, whatever he did, I always moved with him. <laughs> to the left, I am behind him. To the right, I am behind him. And the lady was so nice to him. Oh. Dr. Andreasen, it's so good to have you with us again. Let me check on your flight. Let me see if you have been upgraded. Here is the code for the internet. The food is over there. And she's talking. And somehow he slipped from in front of me. (laughs) And she saw me. (laughs) And and, uh, she looked at me. And she said, I told you. You have to have a membership for this place. You either pay the money or leave. And he looked at her. And he said to her, this is my friend, Dr. Joe Kidder. And for for today, he is going to be my guest of honor. She looked at me and she said, Dr. Kidder, it's so good to have you with us today. (laughs) Here is the code for the internet. The food is over there. The bathroom's over there. Just feel free to just use as much of this club as you can. Well, one day, one day, all of you are going to stand in front of the judge of the whole universe. And he will ask you, What is your qualification to get into heaven? And you will say, I am a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. And he would say, we don't give credit for that. Maybe your parents will, will get some credit for it, but not you. You say, well, I read my Bible every day. We'll give you 10 points for that. Say, I... I pray every day, 10 points. I feed the homeless, 10 points. I went to Papua New Guinea and had an evangelistic meeting and baptized 50 people. We'll give you 20 points for that. I mean, all what you want is get to 100 points, and then you will make it. And you will get to the 100 points eventually, citing all of these things. And the king of the whole universe says, that's not good enough. You need a trillions of points. You have been a sinner 
from the day you were born. There is nothing you could do about it. And your heart starts sinking inside of you. And suddenly, Jesus shows up. And he says, this is my friend Joe. And he is going to be with me for eternity. He is going to be my guest of honor for eternity. And that is the way I am going to make it into heaven. Would you say a prayer in your heart and thank the Lord that he really have accomplished your salvation? That's what it is. Look at a couple of these verses. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name. There is no other way you could make it into heaven. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The righteousness, the foundation of Christianity is Christ, our righteousness. That's the foundation. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. Your material goods, your righteous accomplishment, your religious accomplishment, are never good enough to save you. Your righteousness in the sight of God will never be good enough. You remember a few years ago, there was a soccer team that got stranded in a cave in Thailand. You remember? And it took an effort of the whole world to get them out. They brought engineers from Australia, from the US, from Europe, from Japan. They brought the best engineers in the world. They brought the best divers. You know, they never said, never said, that those just are boys. There is no Messi or Ronaldo in them. Who cares? They are just amateur players. They never said there is 85 million people in Thailand. What is it to lose 12? They never said that. They never said it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to get them out. And they did. Now I want to tell you that's exactly the way God felt about you. All of the resources of heaven were put together to get you out of the mess we are in here. And the greatest diver in the world, Jesus Christ, came here, lived with us, went all the way to the cross and died to save us. That is the message of the Bible. That's the message of this parable. You come before the judgment seat of God, full of rebellion and mistakes. Because of his justice, he cannot dismiss your sin. But because of his love, he cannot dismiss you. So in an act which stunned the heavens, he punished himself on the cross for your sins. God's justice and love are equally honored, and you, God's creation, are forgiven. Father, we want to thank you for that. Thank you that um, you valued our lives by the value of your life and came and died so we might live and have eternity. We love you. Help us to always live aware in your presence and in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
happen to be with us tomorrow too? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll be around. Thank you. You really have been a blessing to us. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And we invite our friends online to come and join us tomorrow at 7.10. And uh, just go remembering what Jesus has done for you. Reflect on that. Maybe read some verses in the Bible and pray over them. And also we're going to have a prayer over here. And the theme of our prayer today will be uh, praying for our children and our loved ones. Uh, in John chapter, uh, in John actually the third one, the third epistle of John, he said, I am praying that my children will walk in the truth. So that's the uh, phrase we are going to claim today. God bless you and be with you.